first corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 to 4 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 to 4 moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand next verse by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what i preach unto you unless you have believed in vain next verse for i delivered unto you first of all that which i also received how that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures so we have been looking at the facts we have been looking at the charter we have been looking at the trust we have been looking at the ministry and we have been looking at the thrust of this news in the course of this series and brother paul helps us to shed light on the facts the details the charter of the gospel the gospel was preached in a promissory way in the four gospels but it was fully unveiled and preached in the epistles in the gospels the gospel was preached in a promissory way but in the epistles it is fully unveiled and preached the facts of the gospel will be woven around certain events like we have seen in the past few days the facts of the gospel begins and that means that any of these that is missing in the message makes the message incomplete these facts are facts that we cannot afford to compromise with in the preaching of the gospel these facts are facts that cannot be missing in our message these facts form the backbone they form the backbone of the scriptures these facts form the fulcrum of the message that saves a sinner and transforms a man to a righteous man it begins with the incarnation of god the word who is called the son god identifies with humanity isaiah says he is god with us in isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 he is emmanuel god with us so jesus is god with us and then we also began to look at the humanity of the christ explained in the four gospels we saw that jesus ate food jesus as a man slept god never sleeps god never slumbers but jesus slept because by this time he has become a man in psalm 121 verse 3 to 4 god does not sleep he doesn't slumber jesus was tempted as a man in hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 he was tempted as a man because jesus is 100 percent man as though not god and 100 percent god as though not man so in redemption he has to become a man because it will take a man to die because man sinned and it will take a man to substitute and pay for the sins of another man so jesus became our substitute in the sacrifice and in the death that he died on our behalf god is never tempted with sin brother james tells us that let no man say when he's tempted i'm tempted of god for god cannot be tempted with evil neither tempted he any man and that's in james chapter 1 verse 13 we also saw that jesus was a man he was anointed with the holy spirit you don't anoint god but jesus was anointed because jesus had become a man a full man so he was anointed in acts 10 38 how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for god was with him in luke chapter 4 verse 18 jesus will say the spirit of the lord god is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised so jesus was a complete man he died he was killed he was crucified he was buried but on the third day he rose from the dead 
in these events are the facts that have changed humanity forever. And these facts are irreversible. These facts are eternal. So the gospel, therefore, is in these facts. The gospel that saves a man. The good news of Jesus is in these facts. Beginning from the incarnation to the crucifixion to his death to his burial to his resurrection on the third day ascension to the right hand of majesty on high these are the facts when a man receives and understands them salvation takes effect in his heart yesterday we established that it is very unjust for any preacher to ask a sinner to confess his sins to be saved we don't confess sins to be saved. How many sins can a sinner confess to be saved? He was, he's been a sinner for years. He's, you know, he's a sinner. That's what he is. How many sins can he confess? So that's why Romans chapter 10, let's look at it. Romans chapter 10 from verse 6. Romans chapter 10 from verse number 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach pay attention next verse that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved you are not to confess your sins you are to confess the lord jesus and to believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved you know the gospel is the only solution to humanity's problem nothing outside it can ever help the gospel is the only solution to man's predicament nothing outside the gospel can help anybody in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 brother Paul emphatically re reaffirms I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Next verse. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, man's only problem is how to stand before God. That's man's greatest problem. Adam's sin produced a separation. Sin brought death. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death came by sin. Sin came by man. Death is separation. Adam was sent out of the garden, out of God's presence, and Adam must never come to God without a mediator or without mediation. He is sent out of God's presence and he must never approach God without a mediator and without a mediation. Something or someone must intercede for man. This is the difference between Cain and Abel. Abel's justification was never himself. His words, his deeds, his wealth, or his appearance. That was not what justified Abel. Abel's justification was by that offering which was a type of Christ, the Lamb of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Hebrews Chapter 11, verse number 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God 
testifying of his gifts and by it he being dead yet speaketh God's testimony of Abel was the offering he offered blood you know God had taught Abel's parents how to approach him since the fall since the transgression man could not approach God without a mediator in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 Genesis 3 21 unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them God covered them with blood Cain refused to believe the word Cain refused to believe God's word so instead of coming with an animal which was a type of Christ the mediator I mean Cain came with works he came with his efforts in Genesis chapter 4 verse 5 to 7 Genesis chapter 4 verse 5 to 7 but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell and the Lord God said unto Cain why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen if thou doest well shall thou not be accepted and if thou doest not well sin lieth at the door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him that word sin in verse 5 sin lieth at the door it's better translated as sin offering that's the way it is in the hebrew language sin offering he ought to have brought a sin offering which was blood because blood is life blood symbolically stands for the life of man which foreshadows the life of jesus blood foreshadows the life of jesus symbolically it represents the life of man the writer of hebrews will explain all of this for us a bit further in hebrews chapter 12 verse number 24 hebrews chapter 12 verse number 24 and to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of abel the blood of abel is the blood of the animal the evidence of the blood of jesus not seen the substance of the blood of jesus hoped for did you get that hebrews 11 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so the blood of that animal that abel offered was the evidence of the blood of jesus not seen the substance of the blood of jesus hoped for Jesus' blood is better than the blood of abel now in the book of hebrews when you see better it's not good better best better will always mean eternal so the blood of jesus is eternal the blood of abel's animal is temporal that's why the word better is used so man since adam will have to stand before god through a medium since adam man will have to stand before god through a medium from noah to abraham to isaac to jacob till the law was enacted to legalize it sin brought separation with god blood brought reconciliation and association anytime the blood was offered sin was covered or sin was forgiven every time the blood was offered sin was covered or sin was forgiven man on that basis could relate with god and stand before him this was imperfect because it never gave back to man what adam had lost it was an imperfect covenant 
all right in the book of hebrews chapter 11 verse 39 and 40 hebrews 11 39 and 40 and this all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise next verse god next verse 40 god having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect perfection means wholeness perfection means fullness only jesus blood could offer this in hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 i like the way the writer of hebrews puts this hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins the blood of bulls and goats covered but never took away sins it covered their sins but never took away their sins god wants to restore fallen man to his presence permanently the regular blood offerings of the patriarchs and the blood offerings under the law showed clearly that sin had not been taken away for good so what then is the good news the good news therefore will be the gospel the good news therefore will be the gospel moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preach unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures not according to experience in john chapter 1 verse 29 brother john will say in john 1 29 the next day john seeth jesus coming unto him and saith behold the lamb of god which taketh away he doesn't cover he takes away the sins of the world he doesn't cover like the blood of bulls and goats. But Jesus is permanent. He is the lamb of God. He is not Abel's lamb. He takes away sin. He does this for the whole world. Jesus does this for the whole world. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26, please pay attention. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I thought somebody would shout glory in this place. This is what Jesus did by his death. This is what Jesus did by his redemptive sacrifice. He appeared and took away sins. He didn't cover it. He wiped it clean as if it never existed by the sacrifice of himself. Look at Matthew chapter 26 verse 28. Matthew chapter 26 verse number 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. For the remission of sins. Remission means to take away. The word remission means to send away. It means it will not be used against you anymore. This is the charter of the gospel. To send away, to take away. Sin can never be used against you anymore. Once you believe in Jesus, yesterday I said it clearly, sin and the believer can never meet again forever. They can never meet again. Jesus took it away. This is the charter of the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 to 19, 2 Corinthians 
chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, behold, all things are become new. Next verse. And all things are of God who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Watch verse 19. Very critical verse. Very key. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing the word logizomai not holding man accountable for their trespasses and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation he will grant reconciliation and he will give it freely he will not count sins he will not take record not because he condones it does god condone sin no does God tolerate sin? No. Does God pamper sin? No. Does God overlook sin? No. What does he do to sin? He punishes sin. How does he punish it? Seriously. He punishes sin very seriously. How does he punish sin? He punishes it on himself. On man's behalf. He punishes it on himself, on man's behalf. He doesn't play with sin. He doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't condone sin. He doesn't pamper sin. God punishes sin. However, on himself, on man's behalf. That is why it's grace. On man's behalf. He, he, he takes it away. Sin has been paid for. God's anger with sin was vented on Jesus. All his fury was poured on Jesus. All the punishment for sin has been done once and for all. Glory to God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 to 14. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 to 14. By which will... By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus once and for all. The blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Look at me. Which can never so they were offering sacrifices they were offering sins they were offering every year they are sinning they prepare their goat as they are sinning they are feeding their goat because their rescue out of sin is the goat at the end of the year they take the goat to the high priest and all of them the priest and the high priest they will kill the animal and the high priest will dress once a year and he will take that blood to the holy of holies and he will smear the blood on the mercy seat once the sacrifice is accepted the sins of israel are covered for one year they go back and they continue because that sacrifice did nothing to their conscience that sacrifice did nothing to their nature so they will go back and continue swimming in sin then at the end of the year they bring another goat and when they bring the goat, another thing critical here is that the, the high priest does not examine the sinner. The high priest does not look at the sinner. The high priest examines the goat. Once the goat meets the requirements for sacrifice, the sinner is asked to go. Then that goat is killed and the blood is taken by the high priest to the holy of holies. But ladies and gentlemen, it could only cover for one year. 
So when Jesus showed up, it is not we that God examines. It is Jesus, our sacrifice. It's not about you, it's about Jesus. What he has done, he did for you. Because of Jesus today, you stand righteous before God on perfect legal grounds. Perfect legal grounds based on the sacrifice of Jesus, the undeserving sinner, that man that was good for nothing, that man that was rotting in sin because of the right sacrifice of Jesus can now boldly approach God's presence on perfect legal grounds because the demands of justice have been met. The demands of justice have been met based on what Jesus has done. The believer in Jesus is acquitted and discharged without prejudice he's acquitted and discharged without prejudice on perfect legal grounds glory to god so the sacrifice for sin has been done once and for all to punish any man for sin anymore will be unfaithful of the holy god this will mean his word cannot be depended upon but we know that we can rely on God's word. And we know that God cannot deny himself. Look at Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. I love the word of God. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more remember here means no record i will keep it's not memory loss i will deliberately and intentionally based on the legality of what christ has done it shall not be held in any record there is no taking to account he says this before you commit them and the prophets foresaw it that this was the ultimate consummated plan of god in psalm 103 verse 12 psalms 103 verse number 12 as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us glory to god the prophets already prophesied the plan of god in the sacrifice of jesus he has removed our transgressions away from us. In fact, I'd like to read that Psalm 103 from verse, let me start from verse 3. Psalm 103 from verse 3. Put it up for me. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? He will not forgive. He forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Next verse. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executed righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses. His acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful. Glory to God. And gracious slow to anger the word slow to anger doesn't mean he slowly gets angry the word slow to anger means he never gets angry slow to anger and plenteous in mercy so it's not a new testament reality that god is merciful that has been his character and nature from eternity past to eternity future look at the next verse verse 9 he will not always chide neither will he keep his anger forever watch the next verse he had not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities for as the heaven is high above the earth so great is his mercy toward them that fear him as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. I thought somebody would shout glory. Look at Micah chapter 7 verse 18 to 20. Micah chapter 7 
verse 18 to 20. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retained not his anger forever because he delighted in mercy. Next verse. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Next verse. Glory to God. You have sworn this to our fathers. That's the last verse. From the days of old. This is the blood of Jesus. The Lamb of God. Sin will never stand between us and God. A better description is to say that sin will never come between God and us. Sin will never come between God and us. Jesus has taken the place of Adam's sin. He now stands between us. There is one mediator between God and man, the man. It's not sin that is standing between God and us. It is the man, Christ Jesus, who is the propitiation for sin. That's why sin can never, because Jesus is already in that place. Never, eternally. The believer in Jesus will never meet with sin ever. They are eternally separated by the reconciliation of Jesus' sacrifice. Am I communicating at all? Never, never. In him we are justified. God's commitment is to forgive man, to remit man's sins, and to grant man right standing. To grant man right standing. Coming face to face with these realities renders sin totally demobilized. It renders sin as if sin never existed. This realities is the power the believer needs to live above sin and his consciousness. The gospel preaches the taking away of sins. The message of the gospel is not just confessing sins. The message of the gospel is not sinners in the hands of an angry God. The message of the gospel is that sins have been taken away by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Look at Luke chapter 24 verse 47. Luke chapter 24 verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and remission, the taking away of sins should be preached we preach remission of sins because god has forgiven he has cancelled it on behalf of anyone that will believe we preach it because it is available we preach the remission of sins because it is available look at acts chapter 10 verse 43 acts of the apostles chapter 10 verse 43 to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins shall receive remission of sins no man goes to hell because of sins. They go there because of unbelief. No one goes to hell because of sins. They go there because of unbelief. To refuse this offer that Jesus has offered us, the offer of his sacrificial work, is to be condemned. This is not a condemnation for unbelief. 
rather one for unbelief for unbelief he that believeth not is condemned already john 3 16 to 18 john chapter 3 verse 16 to 18 i love the way brother john puts it for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life next verse for god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already why because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god the condemnation is not to believe in john chapter 16 verse 7 to 9 watch this john 16 7 to 9 nevertheless i tell you the truth it is expedient for you that i go away for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart I will send him unto you next verse and when he is come he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me next verse of righteousness because i go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged so of sin because they believe not on me that's why they will be condemned in mark chapter 16 verse 15 and 16 mark 16 15 and 16 and he said unto them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Next verse. And this sign shall follow them that believe. So watch this. He that believeth not shall be damned. So the damnation is for unbelief. Unbelief is not to be persuaded that Christ has paid this is the blasphemy to not be persuaded that christ has paid for sins that is the blasphemy in matthew chapter 12 verse 31 and 32 matthew 12 31 and 32 wherefore i say unto you all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men but the blasphemy against the holy ghost shall not be forgiven unto men next verse and whosoever speaketh a word against the son of man it shall be forgiven him but whosoever speaketh against the holy ghost it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world neither in the world to come the son of man is jesus in the four gospels the incarnate word to blaspheme is to resist to oppose that's the word blasphemy to resist to oppose to oppose the spirit is to oppose the sacrifice of jesus to oppose the spirit or to blaspheme the spirit is to oppose the sacrifice of jesus remember the spirit came to be a witness of jesus to speak of christ to speak of redemption the spirit came to speak to be a witness of jesus when a man refuses to believe the spirit's testimony of christ's suffering he blasphemes 
When a man refuses to believe the Spirit's testimony of Christ's sufferings, he blasphemes. So he will have to be condemned. He is not condemned for sins or wrongdoing. He is condemned for blasphemy in opposing the sacrifice of Jesus. He is condemned for blasphemy in opposing the sacrifice of Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. <clears> he <throat> says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 and I'm going to read to verse 29. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remained no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' Moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment. Suppose he shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. To sin willfully here is to disobey the message of the gospel. To sin willfully here is to disobey the message of the gospel. To despise the sacrifice. To oppose or to act as an adversary to the message. To act as an adversary to the message. It is to despite or to do despite to the blood that was shed for you. To sin willfully is to resist the spirit of grace. You know grace is freely given. To resist the spirit of grace. Grace which is freely given. This is not referring to believers. Believers have believed already. Believers are not adversaries. An adversary is an unbeliever that had the opportunity to hear the gospel and resisted and rejected what Christ has done. Look at Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39. Now the jaws shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back or who draw back unto perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Again, he is not referring to those who have received the gospel. Not to believe is the condemnation. So since there is only one offering. How many offering? One offering for sin. There is only one offering for sin. If you reject that one offering, then you are doomed. If you reject that one offering, then you are condemned. You go to hell. God's commitment to his word is undeniable. No one goes to hell because of sins or wrongdoings. If anyone still does, it means then that God cannot be taken at his word. But thank God. That we can take God at his word. God has integrity. He's committed to his word. Forever, O oh God, thy word is settled in heaven. He watcheth over his word to perform it. God 
can be taken as his word. His bond is his word of honor. He has remitted sins in Jesus. He has taken them away. Hallelujah. He has taken them away. He has taken away my sorrows. He has done so much for me. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> he will not count your sins against you. He will not condemn you because of sins. Rather, he will because of unbelief. Unbelief is a refusal to take God at his word. Unbelief is a refusal to take God at his word. This is the charter of the gospel. This is God's commitment. This is God's grace. This is God's honor. I believe in the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not unto destruction. Power is not to destroy. The power of God operates within the conduit of salvation. Any power called of God outside salvation is not God's power. All of God's power is regulated within the confines of salvation. Anywhere you see God at work, anywhere you see a demonstration of God's power, is to save the gospel is that power and the gospel is salvation the gospel is that power and the gospel is salvation look at hebrews chapter 10 i like this hebrews chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 in fact let's start from verse 1 hebrews 10 1 for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the commas there unto perfect. So, there's nobody that can be perfect under the blood of bulls and goats. Next verse. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered if they could make a man perfect? Because that the worshippers once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. Next verse. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. So every time they bring the animal to come and sacrifice, they remembered all their sins are recounted. Every time they come, that means they live permanently in sin consciousness. They are not liberated. They have not experienced a purging of their conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Which is what we have now in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, so if it's not possible, it means God was never in the blood of bulls and goats. It means God was never in it. Because God will not ask you to do what will not bring his own result. But it was a foreshadowing. It was a message pointing to what Christ will do. Are we in the building? Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body that was prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. So, all those offerings they were offering was not of pleasure to God. That's why he couldn't purge their conscience. That's why they could not be regenerated. That's why they could not be empowered to live above sin. That's why they could not be free from sin and the, and the plagues of sin. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the books. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Watch this. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the firsts. 
that he may establish the second. He took away the blood of bulls and goats that the eternal sacrifice of Jesus may be established. Next verse. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once and for all. And every priest standard daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Everybody verse 12. Let's read together one to go. But this man after he had offered how many sacrifices? One sacrifice for what? For sins for how long? Forever. What did he do? Sat down where? On the right hand of God. Why did he sit down? He has finished all the work concerning sin. Somebody was challenging me somewhere. Dr. Damina, how can you say your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven? How can you say that? I know that your sins, past, are forgiven. Present, if you confess, it will be forgiven. Then I say, what about future? He said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, okay. What was the basis for the forgiveness of your past sin? The person says, Jesus died for sin. So the present sin, who will die? Because somebody has to die. Where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is only of force after men are dead. So who will die for your present sin? The person was looking at me morose. Then who will die for your future sins? And if somebody has to die for your past sin, somebody else for your present sin, somebody else for your future sin, then the Bible has lied to us. One sacrifice, once and for all. That means in this one sacrifice, the sins of the past... The sins of the present, the sins of the future are paid for in this one sacrifice. Somebody said, oh, are you not giving people license to sin? Well, people have been sinning without a license. People don't need a license to sin anyway. But the truth sets free. The truth makes full. Once you know this is what Jesus has done, you accept and believe it. The hold of sin is shattered forever. You are empowered to live in righteousness, to live in life through Christ Jesus. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. But this man, put it up again, 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, how many sacrifices will it be? One sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. Next verse. Ex from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Let's read the next verse together. Verse 14. Everybody want to go? For by one offering, he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look at verse 15. You'll like verse 15. We are of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. We have the witness of the Holy Ghost that our sins are eternally forgiven. There is a witness in our hearts that we are accepted in the beloved. There's a witness in our hearts that we are seated in heaven. There's a witness in our hearts that we are in a union with God that can never be separated. There's a witness in our hearts that sin can never stand between us and God. The Holy Ghost is a witness in our hearts. This is the charter of the gospel. It is the only solution to man's malady. Its message is no condemnation. Remission of sins is granted. I believe God. I believe God's word. I believe God's word. Man who believes the gospel is eternally forgiven. Not just that. He has been given the power to become a son of God. He is a blessed man. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. And that is the man in Christ. God will never hold man in Christ accountable because he held Christ accountable. To do that will be double jeopardy in law. 
And that will mean God is a criminal. And God is not a criminal. Your sins are forgiven. Once and for all. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. That's the gospel we preach. That's the message. The forgiveness of sins. Eternally forgiven. In whom we have redemption. Through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you tonight. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Turn to your neighbor. Say, hey neighbor. Sin can never stand. Between God and you. Jesus is the mediator. He stands between God and you. And he is the propitiation for your sins. He is your advocate. He's the only one that stands between you and God. And he is your righteousness. He is your sanctification. He is your holiness. Therefore, no condemnation. I thought somebody would shout glory. No condemnation. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. That is the good news of the gospel. That is the gospel which we preach. The forgiveness of sins, the assurance of salvation, and the insurance of eternity with God in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray tonight for everybody under the sound of my voice in this service online and in the campuses and all over the world. Revelation, knowledge, this truth will resonate in the hearts and minds. We pull down strongholds, religious strongholds, misinformation strongholds, mental cages. We shatter them in the name of Jesus. That the revelation of Jesus and the revelation of the riches of his grace grows big in your heart until nothing else matters i pray and i declare that you receive all things that pertain to the finished work of christ revelation knowledge like never before we rebuke sickness we rebuke disease satan get your hands off our viewers lives in the name of jesus be healed right now thank you lord for your word that will not come back void but accomplish what you please we give you praise and glory tonight in Jesus' name we pray. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality.